Greetings fellow Bible believers, Bible believing students and teachers. Welcome to the Bible Truth Commentary. These broadcasts are designed to provide Bible believing students and teachers with concise verse by verse teaching from the plain text of the King James Bible. This is a continuation of the book of the prophet Isaiah. This study brings us to chapter 4 of Isaiah. In the previous broadcast, which dealt with chapter 3, we looked at various indicators that a nation is in its final throes of disobedience, confusion, and disintegration before God's final judgment sets in, and the land is in its final stage of judgment and resulting suffering, and in most cases, with foreign occupation as one of the tools of judgment. Again, one cannot deny, deny the manifestation of these indicators in American culture today. Some of the indicators include the absence of real statesmen and government leadership, the lack of male leadership, particularly spiritual leadership in the home, the unduly amount of emphasis on youth, the prominence of the female sex, uh, and with a tremendous emphasis on fashion. If you missed that broadcast, you really should go back and re review it. Now, in moving on in Isaiah chapter 4, which is only six verses long, and as Isaiah's custom is, he moves swiftly back and forth between the present judgment that's taking place in the nation of Israel at that time, when he wrote, and the future millennial glory, uh, in other words, the kingdom. Now, he looks forward longingly to a day when Israel will be cleansed, restored, and flourishing as God's chosen possession, and the glory of God will be fully manifested with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, in chapter 5, Isaiah will move back to identifying the sins of the present, including the failure of Israel to return its right standing before her covenant-keeping God. So now, as our custom is, we pick up with the first paragraph of chapter 4. Verse 1, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Verse 3, And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and a shining of a flaming and the shining of a flaming fire by night for upon all the glory shall be a defense. Verse 6 and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from the storm and from rain. All right, we pick up with verse, day, verse 1, where it says, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. So what's this verse talking about, you might wonder? All right, this verse begins with a description of the effects of the tribulation, which is part of the series of events making up the day of the Lord. The tribulation period will leave a shortage of men as a result of war, a surplus of illegitimate children, and women without the name of a husband. That's, you know, usually the, uh, the effects of war, and this will certainly be the effect of the war at the, at the tribulation period and all the turmoil. Uh, the same effects would apply to the state of the nation after its judgment and restoration from the Babylonian captivity. Historically, this could apply to that period of time as well. However, prophetically, it still ha has not fulfilled uh, its application uh, because the future tribulation hasn't happened yet. But notice the interesting condition. The women are willing to make their own living rather than be provided for, as is customary, 
as long as they can be called by the name of a man to take away their reproach. Now, in the biblical culture of both Testaments, the, women, the woman providing for herself is contrary to nature. Um, the book of Exodus 21.10 talks about a man, if he, if he takes another wife, his uh, food or her raiment and her duty of marriage should not be diminished. In uh, 1 Timothy 5.8, uh, we're told that if, if, any, if any provide not for his own, implying the man of the house, if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, this scene is quite a contrast from the extravagance that we saw back in Isaiah chapter 3, particularly the long section from verse 16 to verse 26. Uh, the exp and, and that had to do with the fashion, the, the manifestation of the prominence of the female sex and their associated fashion to try to allure men. Now, the expression, in that day, is used in this verse, and there are many references in the book of Isaiah, as well as the rest of the Bible, to the day of the Lord, uh, prefaced by that expression, in that day, uh, or a similar expression. And there are many, many verses in Isaiah. For example, just to name a few, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 20, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 7, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 18, 20, 21, 23, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11, chapter 12, verse 1, verse 4, chapter 13, verse 6, verse 9, and so forth and so on. And we're just getting started on that. The, the, the term is used a lot. And... Um, it's used uh, to indicate that great day of the Lord. And again, it can include any event from the rapture of the church all the way to the end of the millennium and then the great white throne judgment. So it includes all those events. It, it would include the rapture. It could include the tribulation. It, it could include the second coming of Christ. It could, it could um, apply to the 1,000 year tribulation period. Uh, and then uh, the great white throne judgment, the creation of the new heaven and new earth. That's all included in that time frame, the day of the Lord. So you got to be very careful when you see that expression. You know which one of those events it's talking about because it could, it could apply to any of those events. All right, so verse 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Now, between verses 1 and 2, we jump from the tribulation to the millennium, as is, you know, the custom of Isaiah. He jumps back and forth a lot. So you've, you've got to keep your eyes focused on what period of time he's referring to because he jumps back and forth a lot. Now, understand that the Old Testament prophets, they didn't always see these events as being separate. From their vantage point, uh, as, and Larkin uses that illustration of mountain peaks of prophecy, he sees the mountains and he sees the range and he sees one behind the other, but he doesn't see the valley between the mountains because he doesn't see that perspective. We can see that perspective now. The prophets may not have seen that. So between verses 1 and 2, we jump all the way from the tribulation to the millennium. And bear in mind that the day of the Lord encompasses that it could en encompass any of those periods of time. In this case, he's talking about the the, um, uh, the millennium. All right, he was talking about the tribulation. Now he's talking about the millennium and the glory of the millennium. So he flashes forward uh, to an encouraging view of what Israel will be one day, contrasted to where Israel is now, which is a very very sad state. Notice the, the use of the word glorious here, which matches the, sec, the second of Christ's advents in 1 Peter 1.11. You might be uh, familiar with this verse, 1 Peter 1.11, where it speaks about the prophets searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ first and the glory of that should follow, all right? So the, the sufferings of Christ would be his first coming, and then the glory that should follow would be his second coming with his millennial reign in Jerusalem. Now, the branch of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ here. He comes from the root of David. Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, 
have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things. And this is at the end of the book of Revelation. So the Lord Jesus is telling us that this entire book of Revelation, he sent uh, his angel to testify about to John. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now notice that he's not only the root, but also the offspring. All right, so he is the branch of the Lord coming from the root of David. The first thing to notice is that it, that the branch is of the Lord. Hence, the Lord Jesus Christ proceeds forth from God as God's son. There are four ways in which the word branch is used as it is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And I find this very interesting. And these four ways are reflected in the four Gospels. All right, so first of all, here he's called the branch of the Lord, here in Isaiah chapter 4. He's called the branch of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which would indicate Jehovah, all right? Whenever you see those four caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it's a translation of the word Jehovah from the Old Testament. And so here he's called the branch of the Lord. And uh, John's gospel pictures the Lord Jesus Christ as the branch of the Lord being God, his deity. It emphasizes his deity. He's the branch of of God uh, as the very deity, the, the very, um, uh, as, the, as the branch of God, the branch of the Lord. Therefore, one of the cherubims in Revelation chapter 4 looked like an eagle, which indicates deity. In Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6, we read that God, quote, will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper. Here we have the branch who is the king. So we had the branch who was God. Now we have the branch who is a king. And the Gospel of Matthew sets forth the Lord Jesus Christ with emphasis as the king of, of the Jews or the son of David. Therefore, one of the four cherubs in Revelation chapter 4 looked like a lion because that's the king of the beasts. The eagle is deity. He's overall. The lion is the king of beasts. And so we've got the branch that's the king, the branch of the Lord, which is the branch of God, then the branch of the king. Um, and then the third one in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8, we read about my servant, the branch, my servant, the branch. And that would be the gospel according to Mark, because the gospel of Mark sets forth the Lord Jesus Christ as the ideal servant. So, you find such words as immediately and straightway in this gospel because the Lord is the ideal servant. The creature that depicts servitude amongst the cherubim is the ox. Therefore, one of the cherubs in Revelation chapter 4 looked like an ox. Fourth, Zechariah chapter 6 verse 12 mentions the man whose name is the branch. Of course, the gospel of Luke sets forth the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, described, describing his humanity in detail. And many times he is called the Son of Man in the Gospel of Luke. The last of the cherubims in Revelation chapter 4 was like a man. All right, so you've got eagle, lion, ox, man. John, Matthew, Luke, or Mark, and Luke. And you've got the four cherubim, you've got the four Gospels, all right? So you've got the four manifestations of the branch in prophecy in the Old Testament, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, who grows out of the root of David. Jeremiah thirty three fifteen says, In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. So he is the branch of righteousness. Now, following the tribulation, the millennium will usher in a time of fruitfulness under Messiah's blessing. Therefore, the expression, the fruit of the earth, is probably literal. Joel chapter 2 
21 to 26, mentions a time when the tree beareth her fruit and, quote, the fig tree and vine yield their strength. So this is not just, you know, spiritual, like uh, the fruit of the spirit or something like that. This is literal, physical fruitfulness in a restored kingdom under the millennium, under the Messiah in the nation of Israel. All right, and then also Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 26, mentions uh, a time when the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and vine yield their strength. And furthermore, the floors shall be full of wheat. Kind of hard to spiritualize that. And the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. There will be a deliverance of a remnant of Jews dwelling in Jerusalem at the time of Christ's return. Verse 2 describes them as them that are escaped of Israel. Now, folks, it's kind of hard to spiritualize this stuff and apply it to the church. But unfortunately, that's what a lot of churches and denominations do. Instead of taking the Bible literally, they, they want to spiritualize, and they become the judges of what becomes spiritual, what's spiritualized and what becomes literalized. If the Bible is literal, if, if, if it's if it's plain that it's literal language, it, I take it to be literal, all right? This is very literal language. And verse 2 describes them as them that are escaped of Israel. There are many verses that teach the same thing about the Jews, the remnant of Jews at the end of the tribulation who make it through and enter into the promise of the millennial kingdom through that terrible time called the tribulation, that time which God will purify the nation of Israel for himself. I mean, the, the end of Malachi talks about that, where he's going to sit and he's going to refine them um, uh, with a refiner's fire. And uh, But anyway, here's some verses. Zechariah, I'm going to give them to you. Zechariah 12, 1 to 10. Zechariah 13, 8 to 9. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 23 to 29. And Joel chapter 3. All right, first of all, Zechariah chapter 12. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of reading here, folks, so bear with me. This is, this is the Word of God coming at you. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and I will smite every house of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Israel shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. In that day... Will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf? And they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Folks, I'm going to stop here. You know, there was a time when people used to laugh and scoff about Christians predicting, based on prophecy in the Bible, that the, the nation of Israel would be restored. Folks, that began to happen in 1948, and it's, it's continuing to happen. Now, I'm not saying that the people over there are the purified remnant of Israel, but I am, I am telling you this that God knows what he's doing, and he's restoring the nation of Israel. He's in the process of refining that nation, and through the tribulation, he's going to do his final touches on the Jews, and he's going to bring them into their land. Now, continuing on with verse 8, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. That's quite a prominence quite a restoration. Verse 9, and it shall come to pass in that day, here it is again that expression, in that day, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace 
and of supplication. Here's some prophecy for you, folks. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Who would that be? Wow, that was written a long time before the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. You realize that? Like 600 years before he was. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. Uh, Zechariah 13, 8, verse, verse 8. Uh, and it shall come to pass in, that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And, verse 9, I will bring the third part through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. And I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. All right, Zechariah 14, 2, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Look at Ezekiel 39, verses 23 to 29. Do a lot, of, a lot of reading here. Bear with me. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity before their iniqu for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them, and gave them into the hand of their enemies, so fell they all by the sword." According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now I will I bring again the captivity of Jacob. Uh, and folks, this isn't the church, all right? I will bring again the captivity of Jacob. He's going to bring it again, all right? You remember in Acts chapter 1, when the disciples were with the Lord Jesus Christ right before he ascended up into heaven after his resurrection? And uh, after he was taken up, uh, well, before he was taken up, the disciples asked me, said, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord didn't say yes or no. He said, it's not for you to know the times are, um, uh, that are in God's hands, okay? And uh, that's because they were expecting the restoration of a kingdom. Did that kingdom happen then? No, it didn't, as it turned out. But it would still happen in the future. And these verses and these prophecies tell us it will be. God did not abandon his promises to Israel. All right, reading on now. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. And after that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, which God's done, and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Now, folks... You can say this happened uh, when they were brought back into their land, you know, after the 70-year captivity. But there's too much material in here that indicates that this prophecy is not completely fulfilled. And it won't be until uh, God refines and restores his country to their land and the Lord Jesus Christ comes back after refining them and preparing them and purging them to be his people. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, describes this time. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to them, even to that same time, obviously the tribulation. And at that time, they, the, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, that time of trouble that the Bible refers to called the tribulation is found in Revelation chapter 6 to 19. Those chapters in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 to 19, deal with that time, which is the great tribulation and this time of trouble that Daniel referred to in chapter 12. All right, going on with verse 3, and it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, is talking about the remnant at the end of the tribulation, 
He that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Now, the Zion here, why does he use the term Zion? Okay, you might wonder about that. And uh, this Zion of verse 3 would be a reference to the mountain of Jerusalem. And other verses like Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 dealt with that. He that is left in Zion is a reference to the Jews who stay in Jerusalem as opposed to fleeing from it, as mentioned in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, you know, where it says, let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. The remnant is described as a tenth that returns according to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 11 to 13. I got my dog back here. See also Acts chapter 15, verse 17. Um, but uh, that verse has a uh, very um, kind of a weak application, so we're not going to go over that. Um, Isaiah 6, 11 to, 13, 11 to 13, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Verse 13, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak, whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. So as you can see from these verses, God's going to do a tremendous refining process to Israel. What we see over there in Israel is only the beginnings of what God is doing to restore his people to the land of Israel. He's going to refine that. Okay, he knows what he's doing. Uh, so they'll be called holy, according to Isaiah 52, verse 1, and Isaiah 60, verse 21. Uh, Isaiah 52, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth thou shalt no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. All right, Isaiah 60, verse 21, Thy people also shall be all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Uh, so they're going to inherit the land. And this is the sense of Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, you know, where he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, that, I don't believe that's talking about New Testament Christians, all right? In the church age, you know, being meek and being bowled over, you know, by... Uh, the political leadership or the um, um, dictators of their day, uh, they're going to inherit the earth, yeah, in the millennium, but uh, this is a reference to the future millennial glory for the nation of Israel, and what Jesus preaches in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 is really the constitution of the kingdom, not the constitution of the church. All right, verse 3 also mentioned them as everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. And this seems to match Malachi 3.16 to 18, which states that a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. All right, so um, the written ones are also mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. All right, verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. All right, so verse 4 of Isaiah uh, chapter 4 also points out the cleansing that will take place at that time, and this fact is echoed in such verses as Zechariah 13.1 and Zechariah 13.9. All right, first Zechariah 13.1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness, all right, Zechariah 13, 9, and I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah is my God. The name Jesus means Jehovah saves. All right, the when is given in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. If you've ever read Acts chapter 3, verse 19, where Peter's preaching, um, 
that gives us the when as far as Christ's return. Even in, yeah, Peter's preaching in uh, Acts chapter 3, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins, he's talking to the Jewish leadership. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come forth from the presence of the Lord. When the times of refreshing shall come forth from the presence of the Lord. This is not a spiritual, you know, presence of God in, in the church. This is talking about a refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. Why? How do you know that, Matt? Is that a private interpretation? The next verse gives you the context. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Has Jesus come back yet? Oh, okay. Well, then this prophecy that um, Peter gave us here has not happened yet. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. Why? Because he hasn't sent Jesus yet. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. What times of restitution? The millennium, the return of Christ. Folks, if you don't have this system of biblical interpretation in your church, it might be time to find a new church because the Bible teaches these things, the premillennial return of Christ and his reign in Jerusalem and the rest restoration of all things and the Jews back to their land and God refining the Jews. That's what Isaiah is talking about. He looks forward to this time longingly because why? The present situation in the nation of Israel is dire and they're coming under the judgment of God because of their turning back, turning their back on God's commandments and getting the results, uh, reaping the results of their sin. All right, the filth here in Isaiah uh, was already been described in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21 to 25. It has to do with the sin of the nation. It says, how is the faithful city become an harlot back in Isaiah 1, 21 to 25? How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. In other words, there used to be a place where righteous people lived and lodged there. Now it's a place where thieves and murderers and evil people and corruptors um, lodge there. Thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water. It's, it's been polluted, it's been watered down, uh, it's been compromised. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Come here, Ella. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries, and avenge me of mine enemies, and I will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin. All right, the blood that will be required that will require purging was also mentioned in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15. And it said back there in Isaiah 1 15, and when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. This will be accomplished by the spirit of judgment because God can do anything without lifting a finger. So he says, that um, I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. And, um, and he can do that without lifting a finger. And this is seen at his second coming, uh, according to Job. Yeah, even Job saw the second coming of Christ. 3420, and the destruction of the Antichrist at that time in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. All right, first Job 3420. In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight, and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. All right, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume, watch it, with the spirit of his mouth. All right, with the spirit of his mouth. You remember when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, what comes out of his mouth there? In Revelation 19, a two-edged sword comes out of his mouth 
which uh, is an emblem of the word of God, okay? So the Lord's going to consume with the spirit of his mouth that wicked. Who is that? The Antichrist that's going to be revealed in the tribulation. The Lord's going to consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. His coming is going to be so bright. Unless you're born again, unless you're saved, unless you're right with God, you will not be able to stand up against it. Now, the Holy Spirit's movements were also active in God's creative work. Um, as you can see, you know, his, the Holy Spirit's movements not only will be involved with his cleansing and judgment when he returns back and, and his brightness and the burning that's going to be accomplishing, uh, burning up the dross and so forth and so on. The Holy Spirit's movements also can be found in his creative work. In other words, there's a positive, gentle application of the Holy Spirit's movements, as well as a, a judgmental, negative, uh, destructive, uh, because of the contrast of God's holiness and righteousness versus the uh, the sinfulness of man and the corruption of man and the, and the judgment of such things that God cannot look upon with his brightness. And uh, so we see the Holy Spirit's movements here in, in various verses. Psalm 104, 30. We know a lot about the creation from the Psalms. Thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created and thou renewest the face of the earth. That's a picture of what happened, you know, when the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God started to recreate and started to reorg to not reorganize, but organize the earth into the form that uh, he wanted the earth to be. I, I don't believe in the gap theory. All right, Genesis 1, 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Job 34, 20, In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight, and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. <clears throat> All right, this cleansing will take place by means of God's spirit of judgment and spirit of burning. Malachi 3, verses 1 to 6 in, in those verses, the return of Christ is described as a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. In other words, washing and cleaning and cleansing something. And he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Notice the use of the word create in verse 5 as it applies to the regeneration of Jerusalem in the millennium. The same kind of description is found in Isaiah 65, 18 to 19. Here's Isaiah 65, 18 to 19. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that, I, in that which I create. For behold, I create, there it is, that word, God's creative. There's, you know, there's a beauty and a power and a majesty in God's creative power. He says, behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. So God's going to take this part of the world and this people, and he's going to restore it to greatness despite its sinfulness. And folks, I am a person that believes that God gives us second chances. Amen. God is a God of second chances, and he is going to bring Israel back, and he is going to once again make Jerusalem a rejoicing and the people there a joy. How? By his creative power. Not only by his negative power in judging the world and burning out the dross, but also in his positive, holy, creative uh, uh, power, he's going to do that. And he says that uh, in verse 19, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So even more descriptive are the two words, create upon. Cre not only create, but create upon. Here is a restoration of God's presence and favor as in the days of old. Exodus 13, 21 says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud and led them in the way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. So the Lord, uh, he, he created upon them back in that time in a similar way that God's presence and manifestation uh, and, and his uh, uh, holiness and creative power and, and um, direction to the nation of Israel um, 
and glory was manifested to them through this pillar of cloud uh, by day and a pillar of fire by night. In the same way, God's going to restore that presence of his glory in the midst of the nation of Israel. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is the sign of God's presence to the Jews in the Old Testament. It's a sign of his presence, care, guidance, and protection. These Old Testament signs of pillar of cloud and fire point to Christ himself being present as the glorious king of Israel. I mean, it says, behold, he cometh with clouds, amen, and the brightness of his burning. He's a, he comes in cloud and fire when he comes back. Uh, we read that upon all the glory shall be a defense. Upon all the glory shall be a defense. Nobody is going to be able to uh, destroy the nation of Israel when God is on her side. Now, this will be needed, especially at the end of the millennium, when Satan's last revolt takes place, because as you may have read in the book of Revelation, there's going to be that thousand year reign of Christ with Israel restored. And at the end of that period of time, Satan is going to be uh, released from the bottomless pit and he's going to come back out and he's going to deceive the world again uh, to try to turn the hearts of some of the men as a last, his last throes of trying to deceive the people and take them away from God. And then God's going to... Uh, uh, finalize it all, and he's going to judge between the righteous and the wicked and set up his eternal kingdom um, with a new heaven and new earth. Now, Revelation 20, verse 8, it tells us, And Satan shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. The word covert in verse 6 is used. Let's go back to verse 6. All right. Um, let me come back here to verse 6. The word covert is a covering. All right. Ooh, it's way back here. Hang on just a second. Bear with me. Verse 6. Okay. Actually, I haven't read verse 6 yet. All right. So this word covert, which is a covering, it's a protective covering um, that God is going to provide to the nation of Israel. Uh, it's used in the sense of a protective covering, like I said, and we're taken back into the tribulation again when God's protective covering for his people will help to sustain them through the time of Jacob's trouble. There are various other verses. Psalm 91, uh, 1. Uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, indicating... Uh, protection and indicating comfort under his shadow. 25.4, Isaiah 25.4, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Again, protection, again, again comfort, for his people. Isaiah 25, 4. Isaiah 32, verse 2. And a man shall be as an hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Now, I wonder who this man could be who's going to be a hiding place and like a great rock in a weary land, huh? You suppose he might be that rock that was cut out of the mountain without hands that smote the image um, and broke it into pieces and then filled his king, that mountain filled the whole earth, became a mountain and filled the whole earth. You think that that might, might be that rock? Hmm? Uh, Zechariah 2.5, uh, for I, I saith the Lord, Zechariah 2.5, I saith the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about protecting them. You see this wall of fire to keep the enemy out. For I, I saith the Lord will be under her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. All right. So that completes our study of Isaiah chapter four. Now I thought I was going to study it as part of Isaiah chapter five with you today, but alas, once again, we have run out of time. So much Bible, so little time. But uh, I appreciate you joining me today. If you haven't, please subscribe to this channel. Share it with your friends. Help us get the word of God out. Uh, folks, we're not giving you pablum. We're giving you the word of God. And um, please like and share. 
And uh, please continue to join us as we continue to study the book of Isaiah. Next week, we will look at Isaiah chapter 5. And, um, and we're going to leave that future glimpse of Israel behind. And we're going to come back into the present terrible situation of Israel and uh, look at some of the woes that God has pronounced against the nation of Israel. And, uh, and then, uh, then a parable, a very familiar parable, which you might uh, uh, recognize in the Gospels, particularly in such places as Mark chapter 12, the parable of the vineyard labors. We're going to look at that next time. So uh, please join us again. And until then, may the Lord bless you and increase your understanding of his word.